no two nations on earth are any longer cut off from each other by geography. We all live at the edge of the same ocean, the air ocean which envelops the globe. And in the air age, geography has new meanings for the safety of the American and Canadian people. The, the shortest uh, route from the USSR, which was the prime antagonist in, in the Cold War against the USA, uh, was over the Arctic. Uh, there's no other fastest route. And unfortunately for Canadians, when you looked at it, we're right in between these two forces that were saber rattling uh, and causing a lot of grief for each other. So it, it was natural, that, that's where they would put it. And they wanted to be as, as close to Russia as they could be in order to get as much warning as they possibly could. This was to build, with the cooperation of Canada, a radar early warning line north of the Arctic Circle. Starting at the northernmost tip of Alaska, it would stretch 3,000 miles across the continent to Baffin Island, opposite Greenland. Distant early warning line, they named it. Dew Line, it became. Dew Line was a string of radar stations they ran about 3,200 miles across the Arctic, about 200 miles inside the Arctic Circle. And there were six main stations where you might have about 50 to 80 people. Uh, there were um, 25 uh, auxiliary sites where you might have up to 20 people. And then in between all of those stations were what were called intermediate sites or I sites. In this grim and forbidding Arctic waste, a top priority defense project is being rushed to completion. Known as Operation Dew Line, due for distant early warning, it is the construction of a string of radar bases. Building in these frigid latitudes becomes a test of men and machines. Almost every type of terrain is encountered from ice hundreds of feet thick to Arctic tundra. If I remember correctly, it was around $500 million to build, which back then would be a lot of money. You can do the inflation corrections for today's dollars and cents. Uh, and it took uh, about, I think it was around 20 or 30 months to build. So it was in really an incredible engineering and construction feat. The thickness of the ice must be tested for landing strips and radio towers must withstand howling Arctic gales. On a tour of inspection of top secret bases, U.S. Secretary of Defense Wilson is joined by Defense Minister Capney and Defense Production Minister C.D. Howe of Canada and other members of the Joint Commission. The vast undertaking will cost a half billion and take two years to complete. These watchdogs stretching 3,000 miles across the Arctic are the price North America must pay for security. They will sound the first alarm should an air attack come. The mass movement of supplies uh, was during, uh, done during the summer months where they had the sea lift and they would do that both on the east and the west coast. And then uh, there was continual resupply during the winter months uh, by aircraft coming up from uh, uh, both Montreal, uh, Winnipeg and, and, and Edmonton as well. Where centers were. So there was always what was called a, a, a vertical flight, which was the flight up and then the lateral flights were the ones that went across the line. Generally, we'd get a plane once a week if uh, weather held. Sometimes uh, weather didn't hold. The Arctic. Desolate. Savage. Remote. A wilderness of unending barren vistas. Through most of the year, locked in bitter cold and almost endless darkness. The weather in the Arctic, I can sum it up in one word, which is cold, or two words, which is bitter cold. Uh, in the winter time, certainly minus 40 was not uncommon and uh, you could uh, take a glass of water outside and throw it up and it never hit the ground, it just evaporated into, into vapor, it was so cold. Uh, so generally, uh, cold is the word. In fact, at once I almost, I froze to the point where I was actually uh, praying that my feet would, would freeze and stop hurting because I was so cold. I was in a plane that I couldn't get off of. In the camps of the construction contractors, living conditions were primitive. But already, the crews were changing the face of that far north country. The Eskimos, too, were recruited, and they did a good job. Dark for uh, most of the winter months, um, and in the summer months, 100% light. And I used to actually have to nail a blanket up over my window in the, uh, in the summer months in order to simulate darkness so I could go to sleep. Often, the expression snowed in had a completely literal meaning. But nature in the Arctic no longer seemed so savage. 
for life on the dew line had become pretty civilized. Inside the buildings, life was good. Uh, we were very well fed. In fact, uh, I gained 30 pounds on my first uh, stint up and the, the clothes that I had to wear to go south wouldn't fit anymore. So I actually sent away to Sears and uh, mail order and bought a uh, three-piece suit with two pair of pants and a television set for $29.95. I lied about the TV set, but it was $29.95 for a, a three-piece suit of clothes so I could actually have something to wear when I went out. We're well fed, we got movies generally when, uh, when the planes arrive, we, we get about uh, two to three movies a week, some of them were first run. Um, the, um, if you were stationed at a site, you would have a room of your own, uh, about a six by nine room, so it was, it was fairly comfortable. If you were transient, which I was for a lot of my time, you simply got whatever you could. But I primarily slept inside the buildings, I didn't have to sleep outside, which some people did. We had what are called Atwell tents and they would sleep outside. That got rarer and rarer as time went by, and we'd try to house people in transient quarters. Spring baseball practice started early. While you were working up an appetite, the chef would be doing something about it. After dinner, it was each man to his own pleasure. It might be music. Perhaps you preferred a rousing game of table tennis. No quarter given. You could curl up with a good book. Or there was that other fine intellectual pastime called poker. No quarter given here either. There was a sense of we're all in this boat together. But what you really had was a group of nomads all sort of clustered together. And when you consider that when you were on your shift or doing your, your duty roster, uh, you were on with one other person. Now he'd be watching the radar while you're looking after the equipment and vice versa. So you didn't even really get a chance to chat with that person for any extended period of time unless you wanted to. So what you had on a station of 15 was probably 14 loners. And one social person was going crazy trying to find somebody who would talk to him. What if someone at Civil Defense pushed the right button, and this is not a practice alert, but warning of a real enemy attack? And if it is a real attack, how will the United States cope with it? The answer begins thousands of miles to the north, at the dew line, the distant early warning system, a network of radars which stretches some 5,000 miles. It was certainly sobering. Uh, you had a sense that not so much that you were leading edge in terms of technology, but you were certainly leading edge in terms of what was happening in the world. And you also recognized that you were a very thin line between uh, letting people know that the end was going to be coming. Um, and, and to that end, it, it really did uh, cause you to take the job very seriously. There was, things were very tight. You, you know, in one case, if you ever missed a plane, there was no what happened, it was just goodbye. You, you just got put on a plane and sent south. Uh, you did not fall asleep at the console. That was, you know, that was the kiss of death. Uh, people took that very seriously. Immediately upon detection, the information would be flashed to the Combat Operations Center of NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command, buried deep in the heart of Cheyenne Mountain near Colorado Springs. NORAD's mission is to defend Canada and the United States against aerospace attack. Our reporting process was that on every council there was a message uh, sender that, and we would dial in the information. Whenever we saw a plane come down, uh, we would uh, do two or three paints on it in order to get the direction and speed. Then, uh, and we were never told what was coming. I mean, they would know. And so we would report it, and then if it was a known aircraft, they would say it's Scandinavian 935, you know, and, they, and continue to track. If it was an unknown, they would say unknown, continue to track every three minutes. And we would send reports in every three minutes. Those reports went to the main stations, from all the outside stations into the main station. Main station would have direct communication with NORAD down in uh, Cheyenne Mountain. When the unknowns enter the NORAD area of responsibility, the Commander-in-Chief, NORAD, will declare an air defense emergency and United States and Canadian long-range fighter interceptors will be launched. First, to identify the aircraft, and, if found hostile, to destroy them. Basically, our job would have been over in about 30 minutes because that's about the time it would have taken uh, from a fairly um, fast aircraft to go from the top of the radar scope to the bottom. So as soon as we picked it up, which might be a couple hundred miles out, 
uh, and we painted two or three paints on the screen. We then knew the speed and the direction, and that would be reported. And then if it, if it was an unknown, they would continue to track it. They would try to identify from all the sources that they knew, or, you know, where this aircraft come from. It wouldn't be one aircraft. I mean, I, in my mind, it would have been a whole series of them coming down. So you would have seen all kinds of them right across the line. And then after they went off the bottom of the scope, that's it. Our job was done. We had raised the flag, uh, you know, gave them the call, and basically our hope is that someone would come and get us and take us out of there. By order from the White House, you are authorized with to... With the decision made, the United States will now strike back with a counteroffensive unparalleled in the history of war. Airborne bombers of Strategic Air Command will be ordered to take full reprisal against the enemy's homeland. Others will roar off to the attack from sack bases located around the world. Cuban Missile Crisis was, first of all, for me, the most exciting time up there. Uh, we recognize uh, the darkness on the horizon. Frankly, a lot of us uh, didn't think uh, we were going to come home from there. We felt that we would get left behind. We doubled up on the consoles. I mean, we watched both of the upper and the lower beams, which you know, where normally we would only uh, watch the lower beam. Uh, and uh, there was increased activity by the Strategic Air Command. We were sending the uh, emergency uh, action message, which is basically the fail-safe message, on a much more frequent uh, basis. So we had our finger on the pulse while watching what was happening. It was, it was uh, tense and interesting. The missile age is here. A new and grim challenge to the free world. A challenge to our very survival. We must keep ahead of communist efforts. Efforts to dominate the world. We must have missiles. Missiles of all types for all purposes. To protect our own country. To protect the free nations of the world preserve peace. The major turning point was the Intercontinental Missile and uh, they did incorporate the dual line into what was called the BMU system which is the uh, ballistic missile early warning system. While still thousands of miles away the missiles would be detected by BMUs, the ballistic missile early warning system. Instantly BMUs would flash the warning to NORAD and to MAR indicating the speed, direction and number of attacking missiles. MAR would then detect, track, and identify the real warheads from the decoys in microseconds. At the proper moment, Zeus would be blasted from its silo. Uh, and we be basically became a communication channel between those two sites. Um, that's probably the biggest uh, uh, thing that caused it to die. Also nowadays, um, a bomb in a box is much more threatening than uh, something coming over the pole. Uh, and so certainly submarine launched um, missiles are, are going to get you within 18, 18 minutes or so. But perhaps the true historical role of the Dew Line will prove to be the opening up for peaceful and productive purposes of a vast new frontier above the Arctic Circle, the untapped resources of which we have as yet barely glimpsed. That would be the finest reward of all for the men who built the Dew Line. There's a lot of Cold War history around. I think that I'd like to see it remembered as probably um, a group of hardy folks that were in the coldest part of the Cold War. It didn't get any colder and there was no Cold War down south. We were up there uh, as that thin line of people between the Russians and the Americans, uh, hoping to give people enough notice to do something should the disaster happen. Arctic, desolate, savage, remote, a wilderness of unending barren vistas, 
through most of the year locked in bitter cold and almost endless darkness. In the short summers, a swamp-like morass. Not too bad for caribou or polar bears, but no place for human beings. Yet this roof of the world holds a stark menace to our country, to our very existence. The menace lies in the basic new fact of our time that no two nations on earth are any longer cut off from each other by geography. We all live at the edge of the same ocean, the air ocean which envelops the globe. And in the air age, geography has new meanings for the safety of the American and Canadian people. What was once the impassable Arctic now provides the quickest routes for attack from a wide sector of Europe and Asia. Beset by the nightmare of this threat, the American government acted. With the advice of some of the country's best scientists, brought together at MIT's famed Lincoln Laboratories, experimental installations like this one were built and tested in northern Alaska by the Western Electric Company. Guided by the successful tests, the nation's leaders decided on a tremendous undertaking. This was to build, with the cooperation of Canada, a radar early warning line north of the Arctic Circle. Starting at the northernmost tip of Alaska, it would stretch 3,000 miles across the continent to Baffin Island, opposite Greenland. Distant early warning line, they named it. Dew line, it became. At the proposal to create such a line in that distant wilderness, old Arctic hands shook their heads in doubt. But the dew line had to be built there. Men had to conquer that unknown frozen wasteland and transform it into a vital outpost of Western civilization. The United States Department of Defense faced a major question. To what organization should our country assign the Dew Line mission? The answer was given by the Secretary of Defense in requesting the Bell system to take on the job under U.S. Air Force supervision. The Bell system, with its integrated planning, development, engineering, manufacturing, and logistic organization, is uniquely qualified to undertake this project, which is so vital to the safety of the country. The contract went to the Western Electric Company, the Bell Systems Manufacturing and Supply Unit. An international headquarters was swiftly organized. A host of special consultants called in to help start work on a dozen fronts. Wherever it would help speed up the project, subcontracts were left. The contract called for the due line to be delivered within 32 months. Impossible, some said. At best, there was no time to lose. Recruiters were dispatched to every part of the country, visited every unit of the Bell system, seeking out the right people for the right jobs. Jack Jennings of Dayton, Ohio, commercial service engineer for the Ohio Bell Telephone Company, signed up for a new job as Dew Line Installation Department Chief. Bob Reed of Madison, South Dakota, lineman for Northwestern Bell, finished a job one day, packed his tools, and headed north. His destination? Somewhere north of the Arctic Circle, somewhere west of Tuk Tuk. Don Gores of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, installation supervisor for the Western Electric Company, said goodbye to his friends and took off to become a Dewline section chief. From all over America they came, a cross-section of the technical competence, the scientific imagination, and the management know-how which go into creating reliable telephone service. All told, 1,000 Bell System men and women enlisted to serve in Project 572 code name for the Dewline undertaking. In the same headquarters building, the U.S. Air Force established a project office. This enabled the Air Force to work closely with the project supervisors and provide prompt decisions to meet the exacting schedules. By now, the critical decisions as to exactly where the Dewline station should go 
were nearly finished. Aerial photographs of the proposed site areas were analyzed by skilled photo interpretation men so that tentative site plans could be drawn. Now men had to go north and check the tentative plans on the spot. It was February, the worst possible time of year to go to the Arctic. These were the Dewline pioneers, the sighting teams. They took off from snow-covered fields in the north with a few all-important tools and instruments and the bare necessities for living. They came down into the isolation of a pinpoint marked on a map. They checked the educated guesses of the photo interpretation men, explored the beach approaches, conducted tests to be sure each site would be well suited for placing the new radar and radio systems being designed for the line, and marked the sites to guide the construction crews. As they completed their missions site by site, a 3,000 mile long strip somewhere north of the Arctic Circle began to shed its timeless anonymity to take on an historic identity, Dew Line. Close on the heels of the sighting teams came the advanced construction crews. First a few, an advanced construction party went in by light ski plane. Another ski plane followed with basic materials and supplies and a small tractor. With that much they made camp, set up radio communications, and cleared the snow from a frozen inlet to make an ice strip big enough for wheeled planes to land on. The bigger planes brought in a bigger tractor, more men and supplies. But at some sites, the wind kept piling up the snow so fast that a small tractor was helpless. Then the only way to get a bigger tractor in was to drop it by parachute. The first time they tried, it didn't work. One way they learned on the dew line was from mistakes. They had lost one tractor this way, but they wouldn't lose any more. They knew now how to do it right. Finally, they had ice strips wide enough and long enough for the biggest cargo planes. The Air Force C-124 Globemasters made aviation history with those ice landings. They brought the construction crews what they had to have, the big machines that could dig and pile and handle and haul and could stay on top in the running battle with the drifting snows. And above all, that could work gravel. Digging and moving gravel is the start of just about everything in the Arctic. Without it, you can't build roads, permanent airstrips, or building foundations. By early spring, stateside, the tremendous mobilizing task was in full swing. This was a teamwork job. Government and private enterprise, military and civilian, working closely together. There was teamwork, too, between nations. Throughout the project, the U.S. Air Force and the Royal Canadian Air Force maintained a cordial, productive liaison. Engineering problems had to be worked out quickly, decisions made on 10,001 vital details. Had to develop new techniques for building the dew-line structures under Arctic conditions. At Bell Telephone Laboratories, the all-important electronic experimental work was nearly finished. As rapidly as possible after development work was finished, the actual manufacturing and assembly of the electronic equipment was pushed intensively. Procurement was another mammoth test. Every item that would be needed in the Arctic, from radar antennas to paper clips, had to be anticipated and ordered. More than 113,000 dew line purchase orders went out from Western Electric and its subcontractors to more than 4,600 different business enterprises located in every state of the Union, every province of Canada. A substantial number of these suppliers. The job of transporting the material called for a plan continental in scope. It would include a West Coast sea lift out of Long Beach and Seattle. Another on the East Coast from Philadelphia 
and Halifax. And an inland barge lift down the Mackenzie River. Meanwhile, Canadian and American commercial aircraft of all types and sizes were bearing the full burden of supply for the early construction along the line. They flew what by all odds was the greatest commercial airlift in history. Altogether, aircraft carried 30,000 tons of machinery and supplies to due line sites before the ice landing strip softened in May and June of that first year. Nothing stopped the airlift. Planes were lost, and courageous men gave their lives. But the supply of the construction work went on. In the camps of the construction contractors, living conditions were primitive, but already the crews were changing the face of that far north country. The Eskimos too were recruited, and they did a good job. The crews built roadways, developed water supply sources, laid down building foundations, and made the beaches ready for the sea lifts. At the same time, to the appointed places of assembly for the sea lifts, came the materials that would be the dew line, came the tools to build it. Every item was handled with dispatch, according to a plan carefully designed to put it in the right spot on the beach when it reached the line destination. Supplies of petroleum, oil, and lubricants built up acre on acre at Long Beach on the west coast. Philadelphia in the east. In June, they started loading on the west coast, the petroleum first. Then these ships went on to Seattle. At Seattle, they loaded for a solid month. At Halifax, loading for the east coast sea lift continued for a month plus 10 days. The ships were operated by the Military Sea Transport Service of the United States Navy. On board would be soldiers of the U.S. Army Transportation Corps, intensively trained to handle the unloading of the ships and deliveries to the beaches. On the due line, there would be no going down to the store for a loaf of bread or a package of nails or anything else. Everything had to be transported there and you'd be hard put to name an item that wasn't stowed in these ships. The West Coast Sea Lift was to be in convoy. The slower ships left Seattle first, the others following a few days later. It was a long voyage. From Seattle to the convoy's rendezvous point off Icy Cape, Alaska, west of Point Barrow, is 3,000 miles. At Icy Cape, the ships had to wait on the unpredictable behavior of the ever-shifting ice pack. Meanwhile, on the east coast, the ships out of Halifax were having their own hard going. Some made their way singly to their destinations along the east coast of Baffin Island. The others rendezvoused and headed into Fox Basin, en route to the sites on the west coast of Baffin Island and on the Melville Peninsula. At the rendezvous point, they were joined by two Canadian icebreakers, which led them northward through 450 miles of heavy ice. After eight days of nervous going in the uncharted seas, Eight days of steady grinding with no advance at all on some days, the convoy made it to the Melville Peninsula. From here, an airlift would have to fly everything to other sites not accessible by water. Inland from a staging area at Edmonton, Alberta, material for some of the central sites was shipped by truck and rail to the river town of Waterways, where it was put on barges. The barges proceeded downriver for 300 miles. Then, because of rapids in the river, the entire expedition had to take to the land for a portage. 
Even the new tugboat acquired for barge operations had to make it along this 25-mile stretch of terra firma. In the river again, the barge train resumed its water route across Great Slave Lake. Then it continued northward down the Mackenzie River to the Beaufort Sea, 2,000 miles in all. To the western convoy waiting off Icy Cape, the word came at last that the ice was retreating. But still it was touch and go with the icebreakers clearing the way. Some ships dashed to nearby destinations as the narrow corridor was opened up. Others pushed through to reach more sites spotted for 1,200 miles further to the east. At many sites, the ships had to unload in desperate haste, for a shift in the wind could bring the ice back into shore overnight. August and into September, the unloading of the ships proceeded along the full length of the line. Every item carefully logged in and stored according to plan. Now to build with the material brought by the ships in a race against the approaching winter. Work was rushed on the permanent living and operating quarters. These were prefabricated structures made up of standard units called modules. In the boulder-strewn terrain of some eastern sites where there were no gravel deposits, the big rock crushers brought in by the sea lift were put to work to supply the great quantities of gravel and sand needed. It was in this area where the terrain was worst that the longest roads had to be built. Here, the stations were to be placed on top of cliffs, some as high as 2,500 feet above the sea. Without the roads, module units could not be hauled to their foundations. October. Ten months had gone by. All too soon, the long winter closed in, with its fierce storms, its brief twilights and long darknesses. Finishing the module interiors called for all the crafts of the building trades. Americans and Canadians were recruited from every corner of the two countries for these skilled tasks. The module concept solved the problem of providing shelter on the dew line that would be adequate, comfortable, and safe and could take it from the savage elements. At the same time, the began the all-important task of installing the radar and radio equipment. The wiring of these systems was extremely complex, but experience and careful training paid off. They were ready now to install the radar control consoles, being flown up by the Air Force from a Western Electric plant in North Carolina. But some sites had no landing strips for the big cargo planes. To these, a helicopter had to shuttle in the one and a half ton crates containing the consoles. Another job for the C-124s that winter was getting the big antennas of the search radars to the line from an Air Force base in Delaware. The delicate matched parts of each antenna were packed in 17 crates, especially designed in assorted shapes and sizes to fit into two C-124s. With the installation of the control consoles, the inside electronic work was well underway. The stations were still locked in the grip of the second dew line winter, but the crews could not wait longer to start on the steel tower work. They blasted holes for the foundations out of the frozen earth. 
they mixed concrete and heated tents. As they poured the concrete in the bitter cold, they kept it from freezing by pumping in heat under tarpaulin. With the foundations in, the tower work went steadily forward. June of the second year, 18 months gone, 14 to go. Summer in the Arctic brings a bloom of wildflowers and temperature sometimes as high as 60 degrees. More often the temperature stayed near freezing, but the wind subsided much of the time. Then it was good weather for erecting the search radar antennas. These precision mechanisms would be damaged if a sudden windstorm came up, so once started, the job had to be finished as fast as possible. The crews worked around the clock until the entire assembly was in place and its protective covering erected. In that second summer, a new sea lift came and went. Another transportation epic, but already an old story on the Dewline. Ranking officers of the Air Force on their inspection tour late that summer had good reason to be satisfied with the progress they found. Both Air Force and Bell System officials kept in frequent first-hand touch with work on the line. As summer gave way to fall, the crews pushed intensively to finish installing the antennas in the aircraft alarm towers and the various permanent radio systems. When the radio antennas were up, the stations of the line would be able to communicate with each other more dependably, and the line could communicate with the air defense control centers far to the south. With permanence completed at most of the sites, the airlift was giving full year-round service to virtually the entire line. Some of those new permanent airstrips in the rugged eastern terrain were pretty well, rugged. December and the second Dew Line Christmas. By now, many of the sites were fully built. Project 572 was proceeding on schedule. But indoors, many months of work still remain to finish installing and testing the radars and the communication systems and to coordinate them from station to station. Here in the modules which house this equipment was the heart of each due line station. On the performance of the electronic equipment, the success of the whole vast undertaking would stand or fall. The work went on, and once more the Arctic winter closed in. Often the expression, snowed in, had a completely literal meaning. But nature in the Arctic no longer seemed so savage, for life on the dew line had become pretty civilized. Your quarters were a pleasant room which had quite a few of the comforts of home. Your shift was one of three that kept the radar and communication systems continually manned. You worked through the morning and broke for a good lunch. Then, back to work. On off time, there were various sports to help you keep fit. Spring baseball practice started early. While you were working up an appetite, the chef would be doing something about it. After dinner, it was each man to his own pleasure. It might be music. Perhaps you preferred a rousing game of table tennis. No quarter given. You could curl up with a good book. Or there was that other fine intellectual pastime called poker. No quarter given here, either. But always and mainly, there was the work, the continuous testing the precise calibrating of the electronic equipment so radically new in many respects. 
Through that third winter and spring, more than a million tests were made to check out the detection and tracking capabilities of the radars. July 31st of the 32nd month since the job began. On that day, the dew line system was declared officially operational, completed on schedule in about half the time such an undertaking normally would require even in a civilized area. Henceforth, the Canadian and American people would have a distant early warning line guarding them against attack from the north. But the building of the dew line has done more than provide a vital warning system. It has conquered the far northern wilderness. This remote part of the world may now be put to whatever purposes men wish. The dew line stations may in time be further equipped, taking advantage of new technological advances and meeting new military threats. But perhaps the true historical role of the dew line will prove to be the opening up for peaceful and productive purposes of a vast new frontier above the Arctic Circle, the untapped resources of which we have as yet barely glimpsed. That would be the finest reward of all for the men who built the dew line.